This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So thanks for the invitation. So I would uh, like to talk today about a more recent chapter in human history. So we have heard a lot about the early chapters of human history today, about the early evolution of modern humans in Africa, and also about the interaction between archaic humans and uh, early modern humans. But I would like to talk today and uh, turn our focus from the Ice Age, the Pleistocene, into the Holocene, so into the last 10,000 years of human history. And I, try to convince you that this is also an extremely exciting time period where we even see a lot of changes even in human evolution and in human phenotype in several parts of the world. So as I mentioned, we are um, actually living today in this uh, time period, the Holocene, which is a time period of relative climate stability. Some people might even say that we have actually changed our environment so much that we're now living in a time period which we call the Anthropocene, which might have started in the last 2,000 years, but the main focus of this talk should really be the Holocene to so the last 2,000 years, or, uh, sorry, the last 10,000 years of human history. Most of this time period, actually, we do not have historical documents. So we have no information that people wrote down about human history in this last 10,000 years. So we usually have to rely on archaeological information, for example, or paleoanthropological findings, so human skeletons, for example, that might tell us something about things that changed in the past. So same thing, for example, like a, a migration, genetic admixture, or a, a genetic turnover of the human population. But we and others have actually started in the last um, a few years to um, use genetic data to tell us something about uh, changes that happened recently in um, our uh, evolution or in human history. And uh, I would like to focus my talk today about one event that archaeologists had owned already identified many years ago, and that is probably the biggest change in uh, human history that happened um, in the last few million years. It is actually the change from the subsistence strategy of hunting and gathering to uh, Neolithic farmers that relied on agriculture and started to domesticate animals. And this revolution, this big change in human history is called the Neolithic Revolution. So this Neolithic Revolution started in Central Europe about seven and a half thousand years ago and in other parts of the world a few thousand years earlier and a few thousand years later. But this big change is really the cornerstone of our modern um, civilization because it provided people then with resources that actually allow us to sustain millions and even billions of people today. And um, that uh, basically came with this big change from this foraging lifestyle to this early farming lifestyle. What archaeologists have debated for more than 100 years now is whether this change of um, subsistence strategy from 
foraging to farming was actually related due to the spread of ideas and culture. So was it just culture and ideas that were passed on from village or from region to region? Or was it actually people that were bringing agriculture to different parts of the world, for example, to Central Europe about 7,000 years ago? So this big question, was it pots or people that basically then spread agriculture um, into Europe and other parts of the world? And this question is very hard to address just based on archaeological um, artifacts, for example, or anthropological findings, because it is very difficult to really see if biological identity of people uh, changes just based on archaeological artifacts. And this is actually a question which is much easier to address if we look at genetic data. So if we look at the DNA, if we look at the genetic makeup of the people, because it makes um, very clear predictions for these two different hypotheses, whether it was ideas that were spreading during that time or whether it was actually people. So if we assume that ideas and culture was, for example, spreading um, agriculture, we would expect that there would be direct genetic continuity between, for example, the first people that lived in Europe, foragers, then thousands of years ago, and then the first Neolithic people, and then the people that live in Europe today. So you would see genetic continuity if it was just a spread of ideas. However, if it was actually people spreading agriculture, for example, into Europe, we would expect a genetic discontinuity. We would something see that's called the Diff uh, demic diffusion, we would actually see that people would um, then, for example, come to Europe and change the genetic structure, so new genes would arrive, for example, in Europe. And we and many others have tried to address this question based on mitochondria, but as we have seen in some of the previous talks, mitochondrial DNA can be quite decisive. So therefore, we have decided then in the last few years to actually study whole genomes of early uh, farmers as well as uh, late um, hunter-gatherers, so ancient foragers, to study this question whether there was actually a genetic change of people when agriculture was introduced to Europe or whether there was direct genetic continuity. So we have sequenced genomes of about 12 early hunter-gatherers some years ago and combined that with data sets that had been uh, provided by other people, for example, like the Iceman genome, this uh, famous Tyrolean uh, mummy that was discovered a few years ago and was actually frozen for about 5,000 years in the Alps as well as a genome from a hunter-gatherer that was um, found here in Spain some years ago. And we then compared those ancient human genomes with the genome of about 2,000 people that uh, come from various populations, about 200 populations in the world today, with a data set that is called the Human Origins data set, and it has basically genome-wide data of now up to 5,000 people from many different populations in the world. If you then take genomic data from ancient and modern people and you want to compare that, you can imagine you have heard those genomes are really big, there's a lot of data, and one way to break down this data into two dimensions that you can actually look at is a so-called principal component analysis, where you basically take this genetic information from all those people and break it down into two most informative components, principal component one and two, and if you do that for modern people, you get those beautiful, colorful clouds that you see here. And actually, if you look at the right cloud here, this cloud is actually people that live today in northern Africa, in the Near East, as well as in the Caucasus. So you actually see this cline that stretches from northern Africa into the Caucasus. Those populations here are populations that live in Europe today. So people that live, for example, in Iberia, France, Central um, Europe, as well as uh, Great Britain or Russia. And what you actually see here almost resembles geography. If you imagine this is kind of the northern African coast, this is the Near East, here could be the Black Sea, this could be the Mediterranean. So it could be in isolation by distance, people moved into those places and then basically genetically slowly changed over time. However, if we now look at our ancient individuals, our ancient foragers, as well as the early farmers from 7,000 years ago, we first see that our ancient foragers are genetically actually quite distinct from the people that live in Europe today. So there seems to have been not a strong continuity between the ancient foragers and modern Europeans. So basically there are no modern Europeans that live today that look genetically like ancient foragers. This is actually different for the ancient farmers. So those 7,000 year old farmers from Central Europe, they actually do cluster with populations that live in Europe today. You can see this little green cloud here. If you look at this cloud, this is actually people that live in Sardinia today. And this was already discovered when the Iceman genome was sequenced some years ago. 
the colleagues actually found that the Icemen look genetically very similar to people that live in Sardinia today. And that actually made the authors to hypothesize that maybe he was some sort of tourist from Sardinia <laughs> that had gotten lost in the Alps and just died there and froze to death. Um, today, we actually know that this was not quite the case because we now have genomic data from many early farmers from Scandinavia, from Iberia, from Central Europe, from Southern Europe, and they all cluster together with Sardinians. So it is not that they all come from Sardinia. It is rather that modern Sardinians look genetically like early farmers. But what you then also see is that people that live in Europe today are not just a simple mixture between those ancient populations, so the foragers and the farmers, we actually stretch all the way up here, and if you can actually see those little diamonds up there, there's some more ancient genomes which are on this plot, and that are actually populations which we call ancient North Eurasians, which are best represented by people that lived about 10 to 20,000 years ago in Siberia. For example, one child that was sequenced by the group in Copenhagen from Lake Baikal, which is called the Malta child. So you see that modern Europeans seem to be a mixture between those three ancient uh, genetic um, populations. But what is also very clear is that if you look at that, neither the ancient farmer nor the ancient forager seem to have this North Eurasian component. So this North Eurasian component is actually quite distinct. And we wanted to find out when did this ancient North Eurasian component arrive in Europe. To do that, we teamed up with um, David Rice's team as well as Svante de Pebo and collected also data from the team in Copenhagen, and now put together a data set of about 230 ancient human genomes that span 8,000 years of European history to see when the kind of different genetic components over the last 8,000 years form. So now we actually go um, forward in time, uh, starting about 8,000 years ago, and look at the genetic structure of Europe. What you see here in the background, those gray um, dots are the modern populations, and those are the ancient individuals. So the first thing you observe if you look at the ancient foragers, so the indigenous Europeans or Western Eurasians, you see that they form this little cloud here and that there's a gradient from the west to the east. So this was the genetic structure of the hunter-gatherers that lived in Europe about 8,000 years ago. If you look at the same time into the region here, um, which is Turkey today, Anatolia, you can see that the Anatolians at that time, they only, only already pra practiced them agriculture, so they're Neolithic, so they're early farmers, and they're genetically actually quite distinct from those Europeans that lived at the same time in Europe. If you then move ahead in the next uh, thousand years, agriculture comes to Europe, and suddenly, when you look at the people that lived in Europe at the time, they look exactly like those Anatolian Neolithic farmers. So it seems very clear now that those um, this Neolithic patch actually spread with those people because Europeans suddenly look like that and not like, look like that anymore. So there is very strong evidence now that there was this discontinuity of the people, that genetically there was this large change of people um, at that time period, about seven and a half thousand years ago in Central Europe. If we now move in the next 2,000 years of human history in Europe, we can actually see that the population structure doesn't really change so much. Genetically, people look Again, quite similar to those early farmers from Anatolia, but you can actually see a little bit of this movement in this direction, and this is indeed something that we observe, that there seems to be a bit of genetic admixture with hunter-gatherers that lived in Europe at the time, probably still in mountain ranges and in regions where agriculture was not favorable, so there was a bit of genetic admixture between those early farmers and the hunter-gatherers that were living in Europe. However, again, this is modern Europeans. We are not really somewhere down here, so what's happening? We should kind of look a bit more to the east. And this is the same time period uh, that we just looked at in Central Europe. Now looking at Eastern Europe, so looking at the populations which are um, found here, so this is north of the Black Sea or of the Caspian Sea. We can actually see that this population, which is Neolithic or Bronze Age steppe population, so those are also agriculturalists, but they're not sedentary, but pastoralists, so they're herding, for example, cows. Um, this population is very homogeneous, stretching all kind of this region here. And again, they are kind of falling up here quite distinct from the early farmers of Europe, also quite distinct from the hunter-gatherers. And you can actually see they are also pretty close to this uh, eneolithic um, individuals here, which are actually late hunter-gatherers from this region. But they are a bit more stretched in this direction, in fact. And there seems to be something hiding here, and something I don't really have uh, time to talk today about, uh, but that would be a different uh, chapter in human history. 
But what's now going on with the modern Europeans that live um, uh, today in Central Europe? When does their genetic makeup actually form? And this has actually been happening about 4,800 years ago. 4,800 years ago, you suddenly have a major shift in the genetic structure of Europe. So if we move now to this time period, 4,800 years ago to about 3,000 years ago, suddenly you have people in Central Europe that look like people that live in Central Europe today. So they are a genetic mixture of this step component that we have in the Bronx Age here in the step, as well as this um, early and middle Neolithic people that you had in Central Europe at that time. So there seems to be a massive event of migration. Suddenly you see this massive shift and you don't only observe that in Central Europe and in Southern Europe, but you even observe that in uh, Central Asia as well as in the Altai. There seems to be a very strong evidence now for a large migration. We can then also quantify those genetic components in the different uh, populations that live in Europe today. So those three ancestral components, early the foragers, the uh, early farmers, as well as the steppe pastoralists, you can actually see there is a decline. So populations that live in Northern Europe today or in Northeastern Europe, they have quite a high amount of steppe ancestry and quite a low amount of early farm ancestry, whereas the people that live in Sardinia today have almost exclusively early farmer ancestry, as I've shown you before, and very, very little ancestry here from the steppe. And if you look at the ancient populations, you can actually see that if you move from back in time towards today, you can see that early on we have this really strong component of early farmer ancestry from Anatolia. Over time, you have a little bit of this forager indigenous European admixture that seems to happen over the um, next a few thousand years. But then 4,800 years ago, we suddenly have this green component coming in, the steppe component. In Central Europe, we actually see about a 70% replacement of the local agriculturalists happening 4,800 years ago, an event that actually no archaeologist or paleoanthropologist had predicted so far. So there seems to have been really a mass migration at the end of the Neolithic. So in summary, what we can say is that agriculture likely spread from the Near East through Anatolia into Central Europe, starting about seven to 8,000 years ago. So it was actually people coming to Europe introducing agriculture. What we also have then, when the agriculturalists are spreading in different parts of Europe, going to Scandinavia in the next 2,000 years, to Great Britain as well as to Iberia, you seem to have a bit of genetic admixture with the local hunter-gatherers that are still present in Europe at the time. And then in the late Neolithic, about four and a half to 5,000 years ago, you have this, uh, it seems to be massive migration coming from this region here, um, from a culture which is called the Yamnaya, which is genetically extremely close with people that have a culture which is called the Corded Ware, that stretches all the way up to the Baltics, as well into Switzerland here and into Western Europe. So there was this massive migration which expanded into the, w the West here, into Central um, Europe, as well as into the other direction, into the Altai. Uh, mountains. And one of the big questions we currently have is how was that possible? We can easily um, explain why there was this first migration of agriculture to Europe because you could imagine that agriculture can sustain a much bigger population. So the first people that brought agriculture to Europe probably had a much bigger population size. But then why, how was it possible that 5,000 years ago those early farmers were replaced by other farmers? So what did those farmers have when they came here that kind of made them able to replace the people that lived in Central Europe. And we don't really have a good explanation currently, but our colleagues from Copenhagen recently published a study where they could actually find that in those people that came to Europe, they actually found Yersinia pestis, the causative agent of plague which is actually quite incredible, but it seems that during this time, about four and a half thousand years ago, plague was for the first time introduced to Europe, potentially causing a pandemic. And you could imagine if we have a pandemic, like for example, during the Black Death, where 50% of the people in Europe died, if something like that happened five and a half thousand years ago, it could open an ecological niche, so people could actually move in and then replace the local farmers. Um, just briefly, what we could also do is we could actually also look at genetic and phenotypic change through time. We could actually look at different phenotypes, how they change over the last 8,000 years, to look at evolution basically in situ. What we saw was actually quite surprising that the first uh, uh, Europeans, or the Europeans that lived about 8,000 years ago, the hunter-gatherers, they actually had a very distinct phenotype from people that live in Europe today. They actually had dark skin and blue eyes. All of them, you can actually see that 100% frequency of those foragers had blue eyes and dark skin. 
So that actually goes down blue ice frequency then with the early aquacultures and then spreads again in the last few thousand years. And the actually um, light skin that we have so typically in, in Europe today um, is in low frequency even in the um, early farmers, but only starts to spread in the Bronze Age. So this phenotype, which is so typical for Europeans, this light skin seems to be only about 4,000 years old. So actually quite a, a recent um, chapter in our evolution. What we could also show, which was quite um, interesting, is the ability to digest milk during adulthood, so lactase persistence. That's a phenotype that a lot of people attributed to the early agriculturalists, that basically those people that had cows were sh for sure then also able to drink um, a lot of milk, but actually the frequency in those people of this gene is actually zero, so they didn't have it. It only appears then during the Bronze Age, and it really spreads only in the last 3,000 years. And we're not even sure when it happens, during antiquity, during the medieval time, or maybe in the last few hundred years. So I would like to um, then summarize that the Neolithic Revolution is really a diffusion of people. It was people coming to Europe. Those people brought genes, potentially new phenotype, but they also brought new diseases. And that's actually quite exciting, quite interesting, the first evidence we have of that. What we also can say now is it was not just one migration. It was not just those people from the Near East that brought agriculture, but there was a second large migration about 5,000 years ago. Again, we're not really sure why it was triggered by the introduction of diseases is one possibility. So by that, I'd like to thank a lot of collaboration partners for the first paper that I mentioned, um, mostly, of course, David Reich and his team, um, but also Swan de Pebo and his group in Leipzig. The second study I presented it was coordinated actually with Wolfgang Haug at Adelaide at the time, now with us in Jena and also David Reich's group. And the third paper I talked about, which was again coordinated by David Reich and um, Ian Madison in Harvard. I'd like to thank my group, a lot of funding bodies, and you for your attention. So thank you. <laughs>